we're going to try to jump into, let's see, quick review of Dalton's atomic theory just to kind of center us on where we're at. Remember her grandpa Dalton there? In repose. And the way I remember Dalton's theories, the way to keep it straight is just what I put on the board for you. Atoms, same, same, different, different. Dalton said we have little things called atoms. They're indivisible and atoms of the same element behave exactly the same. Atoms of different elements behave differently. And when we build things, we build them with whole pieces of atoms. Whole atoms, rather, not pieces of atoms. Because we can't take part of an atom. It's all or nothing. Okay? That's Dalton's theory. Remember, Dalton didn't prove any of this. Dalton said, let's assume all of this. And when we assume all of this, it explained the law of mass conservation. It explained the law of definite proportions. And it predicted the law of multiple proportions. And that was that last point, that it predicted the law of multiple proportions, which was so uh, significant because it gave a lot of credibility to the theory. A theory that explains what you've already seen is good. A, spirit, a, a theory that predicts what you're about to find out is even better. You know, so Dalton was able to do that. We're moving right now into some of the stuff I talked about. It, and if you've noticed, again, to remind you, this is the section in the, in the modules. So if you were to go through and look at the major headings, this, this is the seventh major heading of the second module. Okay. If you go online in the classes, the classes are broken down into the order that they're given. 201, 202, I can multiple points within that. So there's a difference in the numbering between the content number and the video number. Sorry if that's confusing to anybody. We did talk about molecules a little bit last time. This is in your book. Um, figure 2.5 and what this figure is showing you is hey we're on Frizzle's bus we've gone small and we see around us a whole bunch of atoms in this case they're trying to signify oxygens as reds and hydrogens as yellow and if you're that small in that space and there are these atoms floating around and oh by the way what's between the reds and the yellows so. nothing wrong there's nothing there because if there was anything there they would also be a dot so when you're looking at this visualize the dots are the something and everything that's not a dot is the nothing and there's mostly nothing not mostly something okay because even the something is mostly nothing in the middle of nothing I just think that's such a cool point I'm sorry I'll hit it over and over again this year so we've got all these atoms that are together in this common area they happen to be just hanging out they're just Stern's in it, right? They're just there, hanging out. It's just a mixture of atoms. But you know what? Having things together in the same place does not make them a compound. You know, The fact that you may be sitting next to someone, be near someone, doesn't mean that you're in a relationship with them, maybe in a compound kind of a way, right? See, there's a difference between having a bunch of reds and yellows all beside each other and a bunch of reds and yellows that have formed connections with each other. And see on the picture on the right, the reds and the yellows, they're trying to indicate that they are together in some kind of relationship. As a matter of fact, using hydrogens and oxygens, what they're showing is that when hydrogens and oxygens come together to make water, they form in a very specific way to make water. And they're all going to look exactly the same. Every water molecule looks exactly like every other water molecule for the scope of this course. So let's take a look at this again. The various, if you've got a bunch of atoms in, in a particular place and they're not structured, they're not ordered, if I've got a bunch of hydrogen and a bunch of oxygen, I just have atoms of hydrogen and oxygen. But if something happens, in this case a reaction happens, and they come together to form a compound, now I've brought order to that. This randomness of various atoms becomes ordered when I make a compound, okay? Because I have a very definite structure that's going to be made. So in this unstructured mass, I have atoms of particular elements. But on the other side, where I have a structure, I have molecules of particular compounds. Okay, so when you, have a, when you have a sample that is all the same kind of atom, 
you have atoms of, of an element. When I have a sample where it's all the same exact structure, I have molecules of a compound. So the structure's name are atom and molecule. They represent elements and compounds. Okay. Well, abbreviating and classifying compounds. Just in the same way, if you look at the periodic table, we've said that every single element, every single atom that we're familiar with has a place on that periodic table. Now, it may not be that periodic table because, frankly, some more have been added since that one was printed. And I was in here just a few minutes, and Earth science is doing the periodic table and molecular and atomic structure. So I told them, don't forget what you're doing now. You'll be ahead when you get up to be a junior. They're actually a, a little bit ahead of us in here, okay? But I'm not saying that to put you down. We're doing more detail. Let's, let's pretend that, right? We got it better. We, we understand it better than they do. They're doing a gloss overview. We're digging deep. No, that's not true either. But anyway, <laughs> so we got a periodic table, and every element that we know exists on the periodic table, at least the current one. I said before, too, that the periodic table was kind of predictive. When they first built it, they knew certain things were going to be there one day when they found them. And that was a question I fielded for the last class. Why is there a blank here? I said, it's waiting to be discovered. But because of the patterns that are on the table, we know it, if it exists, it'll fit there when we find it. But the point here now is when we look at a periodic table, we have a name and a symbol and certain characteristics of every single atom that makes up every single compound. And everything that exists exists as either an element or a compound. Okay for the scope of chemistry for this course. So there's only one symbol that describes atoms that are virtually identical. And for Dalton's theory, we'll say are identical, right? Well, just as every element has a unique name and a unique chemical symbol that's over there on the periodic table, so too does every molecule have a unique name called chemical formula. And it's based upon the names of the elements that make it up. So if I have a substance which is pure, it's only one kind of atom, I would say I have a pure sample of, and it would be one of the elements from the periodic table. If I take the elements from the periodic table and I put them together to form compounds that make the structure of molecules, every single molecule has a unique name as well. And the name of that molecule is based upon the atoms that make it up. Now we're going to use subscript numbers. And what you need to remember is that the subscripts tell us how many of that particular atom are in each molecule of that compound. Subscripts, that lower number. We'll see that in just a minute. The lower numbers say, OK, when I build this molecule, how many of them do I need? So the subscript's going to tell you if the number is two or more. But you're not going to see a, sus a subscript one. The subscript one is never written. It's implied. Okay. So for example, actually, we'll get to that. So I won't I'll wait till we do it on the slide. So if the symbol shows up at all, with no subscript, that means there's at least there's one of that atom in the compound. And if it's greater than one, it would have two, three, four, or however many you need to build that structure. And there's never a zero. Because if you're going to say every element that's not in the compound, then you've got to list every element every time for every compound and look for how they differ. And we don't do that, since a lot of compounds only have one or two or three or four elements in it. It's easier just to say, OK, which ones, do we which ones do we have? They show up. Which ones require more than one? They get a subscript. So for example, I have an atom of blue. And I have an atom of, should be orange colored dist distortion, stuff like that, OK? But I've got an atom of blue and an atom of orange. Now, you might call them blue and orange, but let's say they were named in English, and so what would they be in chemistry? They'd probably be blue and or, okay? Because 
The first letter is going to be capital. The second letter is going to be lowercase. If you see two capitals side by side, you assume they're two different elements. So the name always begins, the symbol always begins with a capital, second letter, lowercase. So we've got the chemical, the atom of blue, blue and an atom of orange. And when blue and orange come together, they make a compound. And that compound has two blues and one orange. So I need to name that compound. What is the name of that compound? And it could also be ORBL2. Now, there is a standard naming paradigm. Don't worry about it right now. But when we do name things, they're going to be in a particular order. Don't want to get too far ahead. But do you feel comfortable that, hey, if I see that, I could give it that name. And if I saw that name, I could describe what it looks like. That if I saw bl 2 or I would expect two BLs and one OR to show up. Now, I may not know what it looks like exactly, but I know there's going to be two and one. Okay, so we we'll supply that to water. You know it as H2O, right? Or H2O, you know it as water. Water, H2O, has two hydrogens. And hydrogen has the chemical symbol of an H and one oxygen. Oxygen is a chemical symbol of an O. So since I have two H's and one O, it's an H2O. That's the formula for water. Now, you may not know that it looks like that. Trust me, in a few modules you will. And you'll be able to say, Mr. Baker, that's a bent molecule, has a molecular geometry of 105 degrees. If you're not there yet, you will be. Right now, you just say it's the Mickey Mouse molecule. Right? You take it, you put it that way, it looks like Mickey. So I might refer to the Mickey Mouse molecule, and it's a bent molecule, a planar bent like this. So it's what I'm getting at is you're going to find out later that how we visualize it is a little bit different than the, like the two blues and the one orange. But the important thing is that, hey, when I've got H2O, I've got one oxygen and two hydrogens. Could it be OH2? Doesn't follow a standard format. Would it be, would you be able to figure out how to, what, what you needed to build it? Yeah, you could if you use that. So in example 2-3 in the book, let me get with my notes because I tend to, to jump ahead just a little bit. This is on page 62. It says, what is the chemical formula? Example 2-3. What's the chemical formula for a molecule that contains one atom of sodium, one atom of nitrogen, and three atoms of oxygen? So what's the first thing you need to have to be able to do? What do you have to be able to do before you can move forward in this? To build the chemical formula for the compound, you have to know the symbols for each atom, right? Which is why you're memorizing the bold print on table 2-3. Because when you're asked to say, OK, when I have one atom of sodium, I need to know that I have one of Na, that natrium, the Latin name for sodium, Na, that that's sodium. So say, oh, give me one Na, boom. Give me one sodium, you would say Na. Give me one nitrogen, you would say one N. And three oxygens, O. Okay. So table two, three would be Sodium is Na, nitrogen is N, oxygen is O. Now build the formula for that molecule. In your mind, don't say it. Just build it in your head, right? What would it be if you wrote out that, the name of that compound? And hopefully you see that it would be NaNO3. One sodium, one nitrogen, three oxygen. If you had a capital A in there, I would ask you, well, how do you have two nitrogens and what is the element A with the three oxygens? But because it's lowercase, I know the N and the A go together as one name for one element. But you see the subscript three? 
that tells me I have three oxygens in this molecule. Right now, we're not concerned about what it looks like as a molecule. Like I showed you the Mickey Mouse, we're not concerned about that. All you need to know now is one sodium, one nitrogen, and three oxygens is NaNO3. Three B. How many atoms are in the molecule whose formula is Na2HPO4? Right now, just in your own mind, count up how many atoms does it take. You don't need to even don't need to worry about the periodic table. Right up here, you can count up how many atoms it takes. How many pieces? How many building blocks are you going to be using to build this molecule? Just in your own mind, right now, just come up with a number. And hopefully you see that you have two sodiums, one hydrogen, one phosphorus, and four oxygens for a total of eight atoms. Okay. I have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they're broken down as two sodiums, one hydrogen, one phosphorus, and four oxygens. And I know that's phosphorus because potassium is K. On your own 2-7, ask these questions. We can do them together pretty quickly. Build, what is the formula for, or give the formula for each of the following molecules. If I'm making a molecule that has one potassium and one bromine. Now, if you knew the formulas, the chemical symbols for potassium and bromine, it should be like right there, right? Now, I'm going to go ahead of you if you don't know that already, because you should, again, from table 2, 3, get potassium and bromine down. Right now, we're dealing with primarily the subscripts. Hopefully, you can do both of them. But right now, I want to make sure you understand that this would be KBr. One potassium and one bromine. KBr. If you want to think about it, normally, the, 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 the uh, chemical name goes from left to right on the periodic table. You're going to put the metals first and the nonmetals second. Okay, so potassium bromine. Five carbons, ten hydrogens, and five oxygens. Hopefully you know that it's C, H, and O. Look at the number of the count you have, and then you should apply those subscripts to get C5H10O5. And see, now it's easy. Five minutes ago you had no clue what we're talking about. Now you're like, let's go. This is easy. No problem. Hopefully, right? Other than maybe knowing the symbols, what information is being communicated by the subscripts? And lastly, two lithium, one sulfur, and four oxygen. You would have to know that it's Li, S, and O, and that's Li2SO4, lithium sulfate. Okay? Later on, we're going to build these molecules. I'll give you the elements. You'll tell me how many of each one you need, and then you can tell me what the angles between the bonds are for each of the elements. But you'll, we'll get there. Right now, it's just victory is going, oh, four, five, six, seven, I've got seven atoms. Li2SO4 means I've got two lithium, one sulfur, four oxygens. And that's what I've got, lithium sulfide. So again, we're going to do an atom count. This is on your own, 2,8. How many atoms are in each one of these different molecules? So here are the substances. Do an atom count for each one of them. We'll start with rubidium chloride, RBCl. How many atoms are there? On your own, three, two, one rubidium and one chlorine for a total of two, right? So it's how many of each? One rubidium, one chlorine. The next one, KMnO4. We've got potassium, manganese, and oxygen. Manganese is different than magnesium. Magnesium is Mg, manganese is Mn. Just, there's a few of them you gotta keep straight. Just like gold is Au and silver is Ag. So how many of each of those elements are we going to need? Well, it's easy now. We know one potassium, one manganese, and four oxygen. Why? For the subscripts, right? Sodium phosphate, 
Na3PO4, three sodiums, one phosphorus, and four oxygens. But this last one is a little bit tricky. Okay? And we'll learn later why some of them are named a little bit different. It's not like we're bringing all the like terms together, see, because we've got four hydrogens, two carbons, and two oxygens because of the hydrogen appearing two times in that molecule. Okay. There's a reason why one of the hydrogens is set up by itself and the other three are embedded in the molecule. See that? It has to do later when we talk about acids and bases and free hydrogens and things like that. So there's a reason chemically why this one looks a little different. You might expect it to be C2H4O2. There's information that's being communicated by not putting it as an H4, but rather having an HC2H3O2. Again, it's not significant to you yet. It will become very significant. But for now, I needed four hydrogens to make that molecule, and hopefully you can see that. So with about the 10 minutes we've got left, let's go ahead and talk about classifying matter as either ionic or covalent. When you've got matter, you've got a compound, we're going to determine whether or not it's ionic or covalent. And ionic or covalent, which we'll learn later on, is based upon the type of bond that holds the pieces together. What's the glue that's holding them together? We're not going to talk about the glue yet. We're just going to talk about it's either ionic or covalent. It's like, okay, are you blonde, brunette, or redhead? Doesn't matter that it's all based upon the geometry of your hair and how it's curled and twisted in the shape of your hair. It's not actually color. It's a shape that reflects light differently. You really don't care about that sometimes. You just want to know blonde, brunette, or redhead. Right? So here, ionic or covalent. We'll deal with why it's ionic or covalent later, but for right now, is it ionic or is it covalent? That's the basic question that we're going to answer. First thing you need to consider about classifying as ionic or covalent is, does it conduct electricity? If I take a compound, so I've got something that I stir into a glass of water, and I put electrodes into it connected to a battery, and we wouldn't use that battery, that would like zap us, okay? We wouldn't do that. But it's just trying to figuratively show you a generalized battery. If I were to put something in water, pure H2O, and mix it up, and it conducts electricity, it's ionic. If it doesn't conduct electricity, it's covalent. Why? We're not there yet. Just does it conduct electricity, yes or no? But here's the deal. Every time you want to figure out if something is ionic or covalent, you don't always have a sample that you can throw into a glass, stir it up, stick two electrodes in it, see if the light pops on. And if it doesn't go, it's covalent. If it does go, oh, it's ionic. There's an easier way if you know the formula of whatever it is you're trying to determine. And that easier way is, we've already talked about conducting electricity, but the second one is, is at least one metal atom in the formula. So now we've talked about compounds and how we do the chemical formula of a compound, that molecule, what does it look like? Now the question is, are there any metals in that structure? Well, lucky for us, we've already figured out, based upon the periodic table, how to figure out if something is a metal or non-metal, right? Metals exist on this side of the jagged line, remember? So on the left side of the jagged line, with the noted exception of hydrogen, left of the jagged line is a metal, right of the jagged line is a non-metal. If there is any metal in the compound, it's ionic. And if there's no metal in the compound, it's covalent. So the deal is, yeah, we're going to go through and look at every element, but if you find one, it's ionic. And here's the deal. You'll probably only find one. But if you find one, boom, it's ionic. You're done. If you check it, and it's not a, if it's not a metal, excuse me, it's a, if you find a metal, you're done, because that shows you it's ionic. So I check each element. Is it a metal? No. Is it a metal? No. Is it a metal? No. At the end, if they're all non-metals, it's covalent. If you find a metal anywhere, it's ionic. As I already said this. If it's covalent, there are no, it's all non-metals. And ionics and covalents, they build differently, which is why you're gonna, we're going to get to this probably tomorrow. But when you build an ionic compound, you have to use the ide names. And when you build a covalent compound, you have to use the prefixes, which is why you need to memorize both tables. They're named differently. 
but we'll get into why probably tomorrow. For today, is it ionic or is it covalent? It's ionic if it has a metal in it. It's covalent if it does not. So, question. Does sugar conduct electricity when you dissolve it in water? Now, you could have an experiment up here, electrodes, put sugar in, stir it up, look at the light, and if it lights, well, you'd say yes, it conducts electricity. Why the light went on? Or no, why? The light didn't go on. But now, I don't have that set up. I need to just figure it out from the periodic table, whether or not I expect it to conduct electricity or not. And I would expect it to conduct electricity if it is what kind of substance? Ionic. It will conduct if it's ionic. It will not conduct if it's covalent. So the question to you, I ask, does it conduct electricity? You think, is it ionic? Because if it's ionic, the answer is yes. And if it's covalent, the answer is no. Well, how can we figure out from the periodic table if it's ionic or covalent? We need to know the formula, right? Do you know the formula for sugar? Good, I'll help you out. C12H22O11. There you go, there's sugar. Now you've got everything you need between that and a periodic table to tell me if that'll conduct electricity when I dissolve it or not. So we look at each element that makes up the compound. And the elements are carbon, and it's a nonmetal. Carbon is way over there on the right side of the jagged line, first full row, okay? Second element you see up here is what? <coughs> Hydrogen, good. Hydrogen, metal or nonmetal? Nonmetal. Third, oxygen. Nonmetal. Are there any metals? Therefore, it's covalent. Therefore, will it conduct electricity? No, it will not conduct electricity. Why? It's covalent. How do you know? It's all nonmetals. See? Boat up baking soda. Well, guess what? Guess what the answer is going to be? Well, let's go ahead with the formula and just do the check. First element in there is sodium, metal or non-metal? Correct, it's a metal. I'm done. See, now I could go through the whole thing. It's a metal, hydrogen's a non-metal, carbon's a non-metal, oxygen's a non-metal, but since there is a metal there, it is ionic. And since it is ionic, it does conduct electricity. See, we're, we've already gone from, okay, this is a periodic table, here are the symbols, here's where the metals live, here's where the nonmetals live, here's how we build a structure, here's how we name the structure, here's how we know whether or not it's going to conduct electricity. Oh, it's just only going to get better. This is, this, is so, this is so awesome. Here we go. Classify each of these, it's either ionic or covalent. First one. Take a moment, periodic table, either on the front or in your book. SIF4, silicon and fluorine. If you look over here, silicon, it is in a column four, right of the jagged line, and fluorine it's over here, first row, right of the jagged line. Both right of the jagged line, therefore they are both nonmetals, therefore this is covalent. Calcium bromide. Calcium. Second column. Second column, fourth row down. Metal or nonmetal? We're done. It's ionic. Lithium. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Well, we know carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They're nonmetals. Lithium. Where is it? It's ionic. It's a metal. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Cho. We're going to see Cho over and over and over again. Different combinations of carbons, hydrogen, and oxygen. So it's a Cho molecule. Chose are covalent. Okay. 